Hey! So that was a 1-6-4-5 progression in the key of G major. It's a very popular progression in jazz and classical and a lot of pop songs and yeah, a lot of music in general. I've talked a little bit about this on this channel before, but a lot of music theory that's very Bach-centric and classical composer-centric isn't necessarily the only way to learn about music theory. We can learn about music theory through the lens of something else. So today we're going to be looking at All I Want For Christmas Is You by Mariah Carey and we're going to dive into the music theory aspects of it and see all the different things we can learn from this song and all the different techniques that are used in this and I'm going to show you how this song could easily be placed in a music theory textbook to replace Bach or something else from the classical canon. This whole video was inspired by a tweet that I saw by Robert Kuminecki. I don't know if I pronounced his name right, but basically he said this. Reminder to all music theory teachers that All I Want For Christmas Is You contains modal mixture and secondary dominance, making it an ideal teaching piece for intermediate music theory students. And I was like, dang, you know, I teach music theory videos on YouTube, may as well go over this. Now here with me, I have my handy iReal B giving me the chord changes. I literally just found this on the form, but then I made some corrections because I found it to be too jazz. So I have that corrected version in the description as a PDF, or you can download the iReal B file. But anyway, let's dive right into it. So actually, we're only going to be looking at the intro of this song because there's so much information in the intro that it basically gives all of the information away. And throughout the course of the song, Mariah is just reusing some of that information. Which can also be seen as something called motivic development, which is basically taking an idea and running with it and developing it over the course of a song. So the first part of the song contains those kind of like bell things that you hear in the intro, and we have a 1-6-4-5 progression. This goes from two tonic chords to a sub-dominant and a dominant chord. Now essentially, the dominant chord has a lot of tension, partially because it contains the seventh degree of a major scale. So if we're in the key of G major like the song's in, if I went like this, you'd feel a lot of tension for me to resolve back here. Now the dominant chord, which is the five chord, is a D major chord, and the D major chord has D, F sharp, and A. So we have that F sharp in there and it creates a lot of tension. Another tension tone in this key of G major is C. It's the fourth degree of the scale and it pulls really dicey down to B, or the third degree of the scale. So this four chord offers some tension, but not as much tension as the dominant chord. So when we go from the subdominant, the four chord, to the dominant, we develop a reasonable amount of tension and we feel this pull back into the thing. It's kind of like when you're going home and you're like waiting for the bus and you have the excitement because you have cookies in your bag and you really want to eat those cookies when you get home. And the subdominant is kind of like waiting for the bus and then the bus finally arrives and you're like waiting to get off of the bus stop to get home to eat your cookies. And then the tonic is kind of like you're at home eating your cookies. And that resolution, that awesome feeling of like, finally I'm home and eating my cookies, is kind of like this dominant to tonic relationship. Anyway, so then the first part is like, Aah. One thing about this is that it's tempo rubato, meaning basically Mariah is leading the band, kind of like a conductor would lead an orchestra, or like an opera singer would lead the orchestra. And basically the music is following. And it's not in a metronomic pulse, but it is still in time, it's just free flowing, so it speeds up and slows down to add motion to this. So it's a G major chord, and then it goes to G over B. So we have a chord inversion there. Now essentially what the chord inversion is, is basically taking that one chord and changing up the order in which we play the notes. So here, if I'm playing a standard G major triad, G, B, and D, the first inversion would be B, D, G. Now the order of the D and G don't matter, so I can, for example, put this D up here an octave and get this. Now I have B, G, D, but basically the idea is we want to rearrange the notes so that way the lowest note is no longer the root of the chord, now we have the third in the bass. This provides motion without actually changing the chord and it gives some forward momentum. And it leads really nicely to the next chord which is C major. So that thing I said about half step resolutions earlier, we experienced it here because we have the B in the bass going to C. So we have this sort of like artificially inserted chromatic bass line. We have do, do, and then we go all the way up to this chord. So that is a C minor 6 over E flat chord. Now what Mariah is doing here is a few different things. So first let's break down C minor 6 over E flat. So this may look like it's really complex, but it's actually kind of simple. If we have a regular C minor triad, C, E, G, Essentially, the 6 is the major 6 interval from that note. So for example, since we're in C, a major 6 from C is actually A. 
If you're unfamiliar with intervals, I have a video on intervals, so I'd recommend you check that out if you're confused about any of this. But anyway, so we have this C minor chord with a six, so we're gonna add this A on top. I'm gonna jump it up an octave because guitar is inconvenient. So we have that chord. Now it's saying slash E flat, which means over E flat, so we're putting E flat at the bottom. And if we put E flat on the bass, then we now have a first inversion C minor triad. So now we have this chord. It's a very interesting one. Harmonically, what Mariah is also doing is using what's called a borrowed chord or mode mixture. Essentially, with borrowed chords, the whole theory behind it is that you're taking from another scale that's closely resembling the first scale. So the scale that we're in currently is G major. Now what she's doing in here is borrowing from the parallel minor, meaning if we have G major, the parallel minor is G minor. It's not to be confused with the relative minor. If we have G major, the relative minor is E minor, which actually she hints at later in the song, but we'll get to that. And essentially, if we look at the chords within G minor, if we look at the four chord, which is normally C major in the key of G major, it's actually C minor in the key of G minor. So she's borrowing from that scale. It's a really nice effect. We have this really nice sound over here. Now, and if we substitute that chord for just a regular old E flat major chord, which is very close in notes to the C minor six over E flat, then we have what's called sequencing. So basically we're taking the whole chord and moving it up a minor third. It's just two adjacent major triads up a minor third. One thing that I like to do when I play the song is go and kind of lead up to it because the half step resolution sounds so satisfying. But anyway, from there we have this chord, and then we jump down to a G over D chord, so it's a G in second version now. Which is really nice because we resolved out of the key back into the key, we kind of landed at home, but instead of a dominant chord, it's like a borrowed chord, so it's a different type of tension. But one really cool thing is that we went from E flat to D in the bass. So let me just play the bass line so far. We have. Now this gets into polyphony or counterpoint, which is something that's taught in a lot of music theory courses. Basically the idea is you want a really compelling melody in all of your lines, especially the bass line. So we have a very interesting melody line against a very interesting bass line. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the bass line and the melody isolated without filling any chords underneath so you can hear the counterpoint between these two lines. So that's a really interesting line and it's a really interesting contrast between the two. It's a really cool combination. But anyway, let's go on because the next chords are pretty interesting. So we have this G over D and then we have a B7 sharp five. Or we can just play a B sharp five, which is actually just a B augmented triad that leads into E minor. So what that's doing here, because we don't normally have a B augmented in the key of G, that's what's called a secondary dominant. Meaning, if we take our five chord concept that we did earlier, so in that case it would be D, G, right? We're now taking the five chord of E minor, which is the next chord, which is also the relative minor of G major. So we're tonicizing this E minor. Basically, we're making that the tonic for temporarily. We're basically treating this as a home chord by inserting this half step thing, because when we have a B augmented, if we look at the notes, we have B, D sharp, and G. So the only difference between that chord and E minor, E, G, B, is D sharp goes to E. And this B goes up. Or if you did E minor over B, you could still have that action. But anyway. And then it goes down again to this chord that we were doing earlier. So we have this 5 to 1 resolution here. And then it goes down a half step. And then down a half step again to G over D. So notice there's a lot of half step things because they really pull into the next chord. And then we have another secondary dominant, E7, back into A minor. E7 is the 5 of A minor. And also, anytime you see a dominant 7th chord that's not the regular 5 chord, that's a clear indicator that it's a secondary dominant. So this one we'd call 5 of 2, the previous one we call 5 of 6. So then we get into this A minor, so we have A, C, and E, right? I'm kind of extending the voicing here a little bit, but then the next chord is A half diminished. 
what's really interesting about that is how the voice leading moves. We have this chord here. We I, I'm voicing the E natural on top, going down to A half diminished. We get the A flat on top, which then leads to G major, and I'm putting the D on top. So we have this line somewhere in that chord progression. Again, more with the half step voice leading thing. Also forgot to mention that A half diminished is the two chord of G minor or the seven chord in the key of B flat major. So this is another borrowed chord from the key of G minor or the parallel minor. So she's using it again in order to create some cool voice leading things. Back to the video. And then we have our one, six, four, five again. So as you can see, there's a lot of different repeating motifs that go into this thing, and we're only looking at the intro right now. And then let's talk a little bit about rhythm for a second, because rhythm is often neglected in these kinds of things. So like I said earlier, we're in tempo rubato, meaning we're not following a metronomic pulse, we're just kind of flowing through and the tempo is pushing and pulling for expressive purposes and following what Mariah is phrasing. But then to get into the song, you hear this line on the piano. So that is triplets. Essentially triplets are just three notes per a beat. So in this song, we got this triplet groove going on. And then the final rhythm we have is, which is actually the swing rhythm, which is popular in a lot of jazz music. This is kind of an over-exaggerated swing, but essentially with the swing feel, you're essentially taking your eighth notes, which is normally two notes per beat. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. And now we're turning it into triplets, and we're playing the first and third triplet. Triplet, 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 triplet. That's sort of the basic approach to this, but yeah, the undercurrent of this song is duck it to 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 so we have sort of a 12-8 feel, but the 12-8 is not directly like dun, 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 ga, da, dun, dun, dun. It's not made super obvious like it might be in some other songs. But anyway, if you want to dive more into swing, actually we have a video on how to swing, which basically talks about the swing feel. And I also have a video on how to find chords in the scale if you're not so tight on spelling the chords and you're a little confused by today. But thank you so much for sticking to the end. If you've enjoyed it, do the thing, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care.